Allie, I think Wayne may have disconnected. Yeah, his phone number is showing up, but... Hi, this is Wayne again. I think we're... Looks like hey, people Wayne. are still coming in. Yeah? Hey, Wayne, there appears to be two numbers that end in 65. Right, one so what... what yeah, you know, what's going on with that is that we, we have internet phones, and so our caller ID number has nothing to do with um, our actual phone number. And so th those are my coworkers. I and my coworkers, we, we're, I presume we're all getting the same 6.5 or something. Okay. So I was wondering if that was causing the echo, but we don't have the echo right now. So. Yeah, I, I don't. Well, good. Let's keep it that way. <laughs> I, don't know. I hope hope that works. Um, let's see. So, yeah, we're still getting people coming in, um, but perhaps um, we should have anybody who's new with us be prepared to uh, say who you are. And I believe we have some folks from EPA, uh, Sherry Barish's group. Uh, who are associated with both the PFAS roadmap and uh, the selenium technical support materials, which were, were um, so the idea was to have them listen in and uh, potentially have a future call with them to be involved with. So, all right, so it, it is now four after. So let's have anybody who has not participated in previous of uh, uh, of these two virtual meetings, and perhaps I'll call out states. Uh, let's start with anyone from New York. Nope. Uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Ohio. My, my name is Will. Oops. Oh. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. My name is Will Will Brogan. I just started with the um, the Water Quality Standards Division for PADEP under Tom Barron. Nice, nice to okay. see everybody. Wow. Good. Well, welcome. Um, Ohio. John Essenick, uh, Division of Surface Water. Okay. Um, Indiana. Illinois. Michigan. Minnesota. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. This is Brandon Armstrong from Eagle. Okay, good. Uh, Minnesota? Wisconsin? This is Amanda. Okay, good. Um, Lifwick? Uh, EPA? Hi, this is Sherry Barish uh, from the Office of Water, Office of Science and Technology. This is Brian this Lanella is from Glencoe. This is Sharon Fry, um, also, also with OW, Office of Water, Office of Science and Technology, and Sherry's group. This, this is John Wathen. I also am in Sherry's branch in the uh, EPA Office of Water. Good morning, everyone. This is Samantha Fontanelle. I'm also in Sherry's branch in EPA. Okay, well, welcome and thank you for participating. I hope you find this of interest. And um, let's see, anybody else who needs to introduce themselves for the first time? Okay, so with that, I actually ended up being the moderator and also um, queued up for two, two different sessions here. I'm not quite sure how that happened. So I, I, I will go start first. Uh, going to talk a little bit about the selenium water quality criterion. And so I'm going to try to do a share screen with a PowerPoint here. So let's see. What, what are you? What are people seeing? A selenium aquatic life for cri criterion slide. Yep. Good. 
Is, is that all you're seeing? <laughs> Are no, seeing the right thing? It's, it's not in presentation mode well. yet. So it should just be like uh, um, just the title side. Is that what you're seeing? I think we're seeing your whole screen, Wayne, because we're seeing oh. two versions of it and uh, like a pop-up box and something behind it. Well, there we there, go. Just, Much better. All right, I just expanded to the whole screen. That's well, that'll do. Good. So um, this this is really meant to be a short introduction to what I hope will be a discussion. We've got 15 minutes allocated to this, uh, ju and so just a little bit of background. Uh, so back in October, EPA sent a message about four draft technical support material documents. Did the second slide come up? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. All right, so that's working. Um, and what, one of them is for fish tissue monitoring for implementation, so, so, so that's in bold. And the, the purpose of all, all, all these documents is really for providing Im implementation support. So what I'm doing here is a little more background, a little bit more detail than I did at our October sampling and analysis call, and a little bit of opinion of my take. And this is really meant as a discussion, so feel free to jump in at any time as I'm talking, but there will be time, time when I'm done going through all this stuff to talk as well. So an important take-home message from our discussion of fish consumption advisories and water quality standards from Tom Barron and Audrey Van Genechten is that a fish tissue criterion, whether for mercury or selenium, is for water quality standard is not the basis for fish consumption advisory. And I, I really and I really thank Tom for outlining this really well. And I think it's really important for us because the mercury fish tissue criterion of 300 parts per billion gets widely used improperly as a reference value for fish consumption advisory. I mean, you read this in the scientific literature all the time. And so I think there's a message component where we might not want to see this happen again with selenium. So so why might, might the selenium matter to us? So the selenium criterion is based on fish tissue. Uh, like the mercury criterion. And th there's some important differences, though, with mercury that, that I'll get into in just a minute. And very important in, in the technical support materials, EPA recommends leveraging fish tissue monitoring programs for selenium data collection. And so I think at least some of our programs have the potential to be called upon for this. And it, this raises, like, to me at least, another question. Um, how, how might more selenium data feed into the potentially protective effect that mercury has on selenium? Might, might there be some advantages to us in our, our advisory programs? So I, I just want to put up some quotes from the uh, technical support document. Um, what what might leveraging the advisory programs involve? So there, there's things here about potentially modifying programs uh, and, and assessing how your program fits. I'm not going to read all this. You, you guys can all read it. Uh, so, but th there, there's clearly in, in the way that do documents written interaction between the water quality standards work and the uh, fish tissue monitoring for advisories. So and I did mention some important, that there are some important differences. So the mercury criterion is based only on fish tissue. Selenium's a hierarchy. So first is egg or ovary is, is, uh, is preferred, but recognizing that that doesn't always happen, uh, next go to whole body or muscle. And so I've got got the, the the numbers there. And one of the things I put I put a couple of things in italics. One is the notion of dry weight, and the other for fillet is a skinless, boneless fillet. So if it's dry weight, uh, we either need to dry the sample in a way we don't do from necessary for mercury, or get a moisture. And the the, the nature of the fillet, like New York uses rib bones and the skin. So, so, the, so, so there, there's, there's a difference there. And so I, I don't know how much of this is going to come to any of us, but I think it's good to know that at least might be coming and be prepared. And you know, I think that c combining 
programs with different purposes and criteria has at least some potential for an uneasy fit. And I, I've highlighted here a few areas of potential tension. I mentioned the dry white fillet preparation, uh, species selection. So the I've listed here the four sort of preferred genera. And I, I can tell you sturgeon is not going to happen in New York. Uh, we, we do not take our threatened sturgeon. <laughs> Uh, but 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 the other piece of this is there, there's potential for additional resource maybe to get get us some selenium data that we we might be interested in. So that's that's really what I, what I wanted to prepare to talk about. And so I'm just going to open this up to discussion and what, what kinds of thoughts people have. So thanks for listening. Um, hey, this hi, is Arjun this is... EPA. I, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself earlier. I uh, I work for Sherry. Uh, I will say that uh, on one of your earlier slides, you mentioned that the comment period closed. We did extend it for another month, so uh, some of these discussions today you could turn into comments. Um, comment period ends at the beginning of January now. Well, thanks. Um, hi, Wayne. This is Satyendra Rabausa from Ontario. Um, thanks for sharing this uh, the, the, this information. It highlights uh, something uh, that's important for our programs and potential implications as well. Just a quick uh, clarification question. So, this, is this going to be more related to the impact on fish themselves, like you know, related to the the kind of the aquatic guidelines or? Um, it also links back to our advisories, which is uh, which are geared towards human health. So, my 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 take on this, and I would be happy to be corrected on that, is that this is the cri criterion for water quality standards, and that's what Tom Barron was talking about at a November meeting about how water quality standards are meant to be. Uh, fully protective and they don't do the balancing of risks and benefits that we do for advisories. So I don't know if, I don't know if Tom, Tom, Tom is on, if, if you, you probably have more insights into that than I do. So yeah, the, the uh, methyl mercury, the mercury fish tissue criterion, uh, and EPA is online, they can correct our impression of this, but um, that is for uh, human health consumption. That does relate to the human health criterion. Whereas um, my understanding for selenium, we're still reviewing this, but um, that is more the protection of the organism. That's correct, Tom. Yep. And Wayne, this is John Wathen. Uh, it, it, did I? Uh, here, a suggestion on your part of a, a protective effect of the presence of selenia, selenium against uh, methylmercury in humans? Yeah, I mean, again, I, this is definitely not my area of expertise, but I, I, there has been, uh, you know, people talking about that. Um, when I, I went to the International Conference on Mercury as a Global Pollutant in Providence about four years ago, that, that was... Um, there are a number of um, folks talking about that, and so, you know, again, I, I don't know the details, but I have seen things like that, and yeah, I guess that's all I can say. Well, th thank you for that. I, uh, yeah, I'm not the world's greatest authority on this, but I, I believe that our, our uh, position is a I better not even say our position. I believe that the the uh, the uh, RFD for uh, methylmercury does not include uh, a uh, a beneficial effect of selenium, and uh, uh, this is a an area of controversy as far as I know. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, I would definitely agree that there's it's not firmly established. Um, thanks, John, for sharing those views. Yeah, um, 
I think Pat just joined, so um, Pat probably can speak more on this. Sorry, Pat, to put you on hot seat right away, but we are talking about the selenium and protective effect from um, from mercury uh, through consumption of fish. So I know there was uh, there was a presentation by um, an EPA person a few years a few years ago, and. The, the sentiment at that time was that, that although there are a number of uh, studies showing protective effect, there are still some challenges or certain issues to to clear up uh, before we can start incorporating this kind of protective protective effects in the advisories that we issue due to mercury. So uh, I, I guess um, it would be good to have an update on that uh, if EPA has any you know, new information or conducted any assessment that could further speak on that topic. Um, as Wayne mentioned in the beginning, this is more like a kind of an introduction or, or background on this uh, particular topic. We don't have a whole lot of time today on, on the agenda for this uh, particular item, but, you know, we are hoping that uh, sometime down the road, like we can have a dedicated uh, call for the group, specifically for sampling and analysis folks, so that we can have detailed discussion on What's the progress on this particular topic? So speaking from Ontario's side, uh, you know, we have a uh, you know, fair bit of uh, data collected over the years and we are working on publishing this information and we have seen uh, clear, you know, uh, negative relationship between mercury and selenium. So with increasing selenium, there are less mercury. And if, um, if this protective effect is uh, indeed there, then, you know, it would be very beneficial to to include it in the advisories because that would allow uh, a lot more consumption of fish on a safely uh, basis. So uh, just a quick thought on that. Hi, this is Pat. I'm sorry I missed the presentation. And um, Satyendra, I agree with what you said that uh, last time I looked into this topic, there was definitely a lot of questions still open as far as human health uh, related protection from selenium. Um, I don't, I think that the animal, I don't think that the, it, it has been shown that the protection in animals or fish relates to a pathway that's present in humans. And so I do think there's a lot of um, work still needs to be done in this area. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, uh, I think there are the, a lot of the information I've seen is uh, relating to looking at the ratios within the fish, and that may impact the uh, absorption of mercury. Uh, and there was also a lot of uh, interest in that uh, with the whale consumption. So that it's more not that you can take selenium to protect you against the mercury, but it was more uh, the interaction within the species that you're consuming may reduce uh, uh, the uh, the amount of mercury that's available to be absorbed. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's one part of this. I guess the other part of the discussion is how how might this affect our existing programs? Are are we going to be called upon to start analyzing fish for selenium? Will that be separate? Uh, and any, I mean, I I'd actually had a call scheduled with our water quality folks for earlier this week. And that had to get postponed until Friday. I was hoping to have some sense of introduction within our state, but I, I don't have that. I don't know if this has come up at all for anyone. Okay, and we have about a minute left. Um, Indiana's been, or we added selenium to our suite of metals, uh, I think in 2008, but we haven't used it yet. Um, I'm not sure Indiana's officially adopted the criteria yet, so we haven't used it for any sort of um, assessment processes, but we have the data and it is one of our 
uh, normal suite of parameters that we analyze every year. Yeah, I Michigan guess the only also... diff... Go ahead, Allie. I was just going to, I guess one thing real quick is we don't prepare the fish as described specifically in the document, though, because we do leave the skin on. Yeah, I was just going to say Michigan does um, analyze some fish for selenium in a um, specific area of the Upper Peninsula where there's selenium issues um, as well as mercury issues. Um, so that's something that we routinely sample those fish for, and I think most of them are typically brook trout. This is Audrey from Ohio uh, EPA standards and um, we have not adopted the selenium criteria yet, but we do have a couple of permittees that want to use it as a demonstration of water quality standards. So uh, we had one a number of years ago and then that facility ended up closing, but we have one in front of us right now that we're evaluating. Okay. Wayne, this is Shari Barish. I was just going to mention, I, um, you know, the, the, dry weight, um, wet weight issue. Um, I just wanted to mention to people the reason why it ended up being dry weight, which I think, you know, internally those in, in our fish advisory program, you know, we're also like, why does it need to be dry weight? That That's not what people do. Um, I think it's because the scientific studies that underlie the development of the criteria were all in dry weight. So that's sort of how they, you know, so to develop the number, they relied on these um, particular studies. So all the information was in dry weight. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, conversion is possible. I mean, there's, you know, moisture content in fish doesn't vary tremendously, particularly within the species. So it, I, I meant to mention, so it's it's possible for um, conver, you know, conversion to occur. So I th it's time for us to move on and... Uh, thank you, and maybe I think we will try to do another sampling and analysis call and uh, perhaps give EPA folks more of a chance to participate in this. But I'm going to move on to, I happen to be first up for uh, state presentations on PFAS. So uh, with that, I'm going to switch my slides somehow. Uh, let's try this one. There we go. All right, are we seeing the other one now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Think good. So. so, first of all, I, I want, I'm going to follow Satendra's lead and give a quick review of our program since since many are relatively new to the consortium. Uh, so, uh, what we analyze fish for, we have our own laboratory. We do mercury, PCBs as aerochlorous, organochlorine pesticides, PFAS, and we've got a metals analyzer coming online. We also use contract labs uh, for PCBs, mostly as congeners. PFAS at uh, SGS axis, dioxins and furans and polybromine diphenyl ethers, and then uh, lesser amounts of some of the more exotic contaminants of emerging concern. So um, this is our sort of at the top, you know, standard annual programs, about 800 samples for PCBs and organic chlorine pesticides, 1,000 for mercury, and targeting 750 for PFAS. We also do about 400 in the Hudson River for the PCB Superfund every other year, and we have special projects that might be 100 to 400 per year. And we, we, we do these for fish consumption advisories, uh, also for long-term monitoring. Fish are really good environmental integrators and helps us find problem areas, noting for uh, areas needing remediation, and also potential PFAS re release sites and uh, where, whether uh, sites where PFAS may be used is getting into the environment. So a lot of people make this possible uh, in, in our, my group, um, our lab, uh, our fisheries, and contract laboratories. So w what uh, the other thing I'll mention is that in New York, uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation, where I work, the division of responsibility is we collect and analyze fish, and then the Department of Health, and you've heard from our DOH colleagues earlier in these sessions, has primary responsibility for setting and communicating advisories, though there, there's definitely coordination about involved in that. 
So what I want to do is give you a few highlights from our recent results and then talk about what we've done this year and what's coming. And so we'll start with some great, whoops, back up, uh, sorry. Start with a few Great Lakes items. Uh, we're still finding some Myrex in Lake Ontario lake trout and walleye for a couple of bays. It's not above advisory levels, but some, some of them are close. And more, more generally, we do have locations around New York where organochlorine pesticides remain an issue, and that seems to be a difference from some of the uh, state updates and province updates that we've heard earlier. Uh, we have some Lake Ontario lake trout results where PCB concentrations suggest the continued need for advisories. Uh, I mean, this is definitely DOH's call, but the numbers still support that that I'm seeing. And we were able to do a retrospective analysis of some dioxin and furans from a bunch of Niagara River and Lake Ontario fish. These are in final quality review, so I don't really have much to talk about on that yet. So on to PFAS. Our program is really getting going in our lab. We have about 650 analyses reported so far this year. Uh, that's Cat Williams' work and uh, primarily in really pleased about that. So I, I do want to highlight a few interesting highlights. So this is from a place called Donahue's Pond. It's an impoundment in the Peconic River on Long Island. It's downstream from Brookhaven National Laboratory. Each line here represents an individual fish, and they're color-coded by species. And what you can see here is that the, the highest concentrations are in PFUNA, that's the 11 carbon carboxylic acid, and that was definitely a surprise. We've never seen PFUNA levels that high. We've never seen it higher than PFOS, and what's interesting is the red lines are the brown bullheads, which typically we don't see PFOS in, as you can see, but we've seen PFUNA. Uh, also, if we look at the PFNA on the left, the pumpkin seeds are have this in some measure, whereas the largemouth bass don't. And it's, you know, this not really sure what to make of this, but uh, so this was 2018. The next year we went to the Conic Lake, which is a downstream impoundment. And again, we have brown bullhead, and this time we have yellow perch, and we had even higher PF UNA numbers. Uh, in, 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 I mean, the yellow perch were higher than anything we'd seen, and the brown bullheads were higher than upstream. And in fact, if we take the sum of the PFUNA and the PFOS in the yellow perch, we uh, slightly over 51 parts per billion as an average, So, which is above the 50 part per billion best practice value for a one meal per month advisory. And if we put in the PFNA and PFDA, Along with that, the, the mean is just over 58 parts per billion. So I, I don't really know what to make of this. Uh, and fortunately for me, I guess, the advisory decision is in health ballpark. But uh, And this, this brings up something we talked about some years ago in the consortium, which is how we deal with mixtures. Uh, what about other PFAS? And so I've, I've thought that we may want to have a, a sampling analysis call about this. But cl clearly, the, the behavior of PFAS and fish is still a, a learning experience for us. Uh, some of our other interesting PFAS results, uh, we finally got some places where we really had non-detects in abundance, which is really nice. We don't have a lot of those. Uh, one was the east branch of the Delaware River for brown trout. An uh, important one was Long Island Sound striped bass were just about all non-detect, and that's a good thing because the marine fishery for striped bass is a big deal. And we had in Otisco Lake, which is one of our Finger Lake region area, uh, yellow perch were all non-detect, and uh, walleye were just over the detection limit. So another thing we've been doing is collections associated with firefighting training sites, Many of these are in small streams, and our sampling often includes small whole fish as well as fillets. And what's interesting is some of these are not showing much of anything, fairly close to background, and others we're seeing in effect. So uh, clearly what's going on with firefighting training sites is potentially complex. One Hi. other thing is we... Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. This is Sharon Fry. Can I just ask a question about this 
graph. I, I know you, I totally understand that you said you don't know what to make of it. You guys are learning about it, all that. And you mentioned the firefighting foam issue, but I'm just curious if based on this, if you guys then took this data and then went out and looked for a source or you just haven't gotten to that yet. So tell you what, could we hold that for our discussion time? Sure. Because we, we have a discussion at the end of all these sessions. And Wayne, I'm not sure your slides are advancing. We're still seeing Peconic Lake 2019. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. I'm just talking. I don't have a slide for everything, but thank you for bringing that in. Yeah, let's talk about that as a discussion so we can try to stay on schedule. Um, so let's see. Um, we had one snakehead on Long Island with 125 parts per billion at a relic airport site. And uh, it was the only one collected from there, and several were low to non-detected in nearby water. So I don't know what's going on with snakeheads. Uh, so we have some results for our Young of Year project. We talked about this. Uh, this is where we sample Young of Year fish from multiple sites in New York. Uh, uh, these aren't fillets, but they have... And the primary purpose is long-term tracking of the environment. But they do have some re relevance to advisories because they can point to potential problems and for sport fish and because some communities we've heard are eating small whole fish. So here's a look at our PFAS results from our Niagara River, Cayuga Creek, Love Canal area. The green numbers are the average PFAS concentration in the composites. And in some cases, there's more than one species here. And as you can see, some of these are pretty high. Uh, and there's a potential source with Niagara Falls International Airport up there uh, and also the Air Reserve Station. So, again, um, we'll talk about implications of that at discussion. Uh, we also had here our first non-trivial PFBA concentrations. We had some means in the upper single digits, which is not a lot, parts per billion, but more than we've seen elsewhere. And sometimes these were second place only to PFAS. So on to this year, for smelt, we collected from the Great Lakes and also four inland sites. Uh, and so we'll be getting results on that. Uh, we also received a GLRI Objective 3, 1.3 grant to look at chemicals of mutual concern in Lake Erie fish. So these are our 2020 collections. Uh, we're going to look for... A bunch, the GLRI is funding at the top contaminants of emerging concern and other priority chemicals at contract labs, and this is added on to work that we're doing at our laboratory, uh, which includes PFAS and other legacy contaminants. And we didn't get everything we wanted in 2020, so we're adding on some additional sites in 2021 uh, that, or additional fish in 2021 that. Um, will do with, we identified New York State funding. So some other uh, Great Lakes collections, um, we did a repeat at 18 Mile Creek, which Henry Sweetoff talked about. We've got some Upper Niagara River and walleye and steelhead from Lake Erie in addition to these five species. And we have coho, chinook, and steelhead from Eastern Lake Ontario, which is something we do about every three years. Uh, we also have uh, fish from about 36 inland water bodies, including nine additional PFAS locations. We also have, I want to show you the last slide, uh, we're doing a blue crab study. Uh, look at cadmium because there's a battery factory site that released cadmium. We'll also be looking at, we also have advisories for PCBs, and we'll also be um, looking at PFAS there. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen as soon as I can figure out how to do that there. Okay, and up next is uh, Indiana, Allie and Grace, so take it away, please. Hi, everyone. I'll get our slides pulled up here. All right, how does that look for everyone? Looks good. Perfect. All right, um, I'll go ahead and get us started. Um, so I'm Allie Miles and I'm with the Indiana Department of Environmental Management. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the GLRI grant that was awarded to Indiana in July of 2020. Um, and then 
Grace is going to finish off the presentation and talk to you about their portion of the work on the grant. Um, to my knowledge, this is the first grant that has ever been awarded to Indiana. Um, and there was certainly a slight learning curve when it came to figuring out all the paperwork that was required, um, but everyone from EPA was extremely helpful. And I even reached out to Pat in Minnesota to get some um, advice and some information. So that's just one more plug on the importance of the consortium because it's helpful to have contacts uh, from other states to reach out to because most of the time other states have already done or have experience um, doing what, what you plan to do. Um, next slide, Grace. So the project of our, or the title of our project is Production and Distribution of Indiana Fish Consumption Advisory Outreach Material and Perm Polyfloral Alkyl substance, Substances in the Indiana Portions of the Great Lakes Basins. Um, so that's a mouthful, um, but it needed to be so because it's really two separate projects wrapped up into a single grant. Um, there's the sampling and analysis portion, which is managed by item, and then there's an outreach and education portion that is managed by the health department. Uh, next slide. So the goal of the sampling analysis portion of the grant is to support section 1.3 of the GLRI action plan, and that is to increase knowledge about chemicals of mutual concern. And in this case, those chemicals are PFAS. Um, and we'll be characterizing the location um, and magnitude of PFAS in the Indiana portion of the Great Lakes basins to do so. Next slide. So Indiana began sampling PFAS in 2017. And due to the way that we rotate around the state, 2020 was the first year that we would be sampling in the Great Lakes basins while having the capability to include PFAS in our analyses. Um, so this grant allowed us to basically double the coverage in the basin, which will help us better understand the concentrations and distributions um, in that part of the state. And in addition, we'll also be using that data to support the fish consumption guidelines. So this slide um, is a map of the Great Lakes basins. And we, in Indiana, we have three main Great Lake basins. The pink and blue in the northwest part of the map, um, those tributaries drain directly into Lake Michigan. And then the purple basin in the middle is the St. Joseph River, which ultimately uh, flows through Michigan and into Lake Michigan. And then the basins to the east of the state flow into the Ohio uh, or flow into Ohio by way of the Maumee and then eventually up to Lake Erie. So this is the area that was covered as part of our study. Um, so since we were, as I mentioned, we were already sampling in those basins as part of our normal routine monitoring. So the green sites on the map are those sites we were already planning on sampling. So the GLRI grant allowed us to add all of the sites you see in yellow to fill in gaps and increase coverage. Um, sites are located in both urban and rural areas, and some sites were selected based on their locations to cities and wastewater treatment plants. We sampled a total of 76 sites and collected 184 samples. We targeted or tried to target black bass, sunfish, and suckers just to try to be able to compare um, similar species across the regions. And then we analyzed all the samples for pesticides, metals, PCBs, and PFAS. Yep, thank you. Um, so I'm going to start out by just talking about our Lake Michigan results. Um, and this graph actually includes all of our Lake Michigan data. So all, any samples we had collected from 2017 on. And as you can see here, um, PFOS are very low in all samples across the board, both salmonid and non-salmonid species. Um, so for us, all of this data would 
um, would mean unrestricted advice for these fish. Um, if Indiana does not use the two meals per week category, um, so if that is something your state uses, then some of these would probably fall into the two meal, two meal per week category. Next slide. Um, so the two pie charts on the left side of the screen show um, the PFAS compounds in salmonids and then non-salmonids on the bottom. And obviously it's no surprise that PFOS was dominant in all samples. But the interesting, I, oh, sorry, go back, Grace. The interesting thing um, on the pie charts on the right that I found was that uh, on the top, the top right pie chart is a salmonid PFAS distribution um, without PFOS. And and the purple part shows that the PFHXA is is the other dominant PFAS other than PFOS. Um, so I just thought that was interesting because it did make up such a large portion of the rest of the mixture. Um, but when I dug a little deeper, um, the data showed that it was really only detected in rainbow trout and no other salmonids. So again, I don't know what that means since we're all just kind of playing around with the data at this point, um, but I did think that was interesting that it was only found in rainbow trout. Okay, next slide. Here's a map of, well, I guess I should back up. Um, so we have only received data back for a portion of our samples. So this um, data analysis is really only based on partial data set. But based on what we do have, um, this map breaks out the PFOS results into meal categories. And as you can see here, um, there's only one site that would uh, warrant a one meal per month uh, advisory based on PFOS. And it just so happens that that water body is Marquette Lagoon, which is also known as the Grand Calumet Lagoons, and it's already listed as do not eat for other contaminants. So it still wouldn't be the driver. Um, there, are, there are the higher concentrations were obviously in the northwest region of the state, which is uh, very industrialized and um, highly populated, very urban area. So I guess that's not surprising, although based on the land use and other contaminant data we have, I'm, I've, I'm not certain that PFOS would drive any of those advisories. Next slide. And then this is just, um, again, a different way to look at the data when you remove PFOS to kind of see what's going on with the other PFAS compounds. Um, so the other dominant PFAS are PFUNA, PFDA, and PFDOA, and that seems pretty consistent across the board. Um, there was one hit um, in the purple basin Let's see, there was a, a larger hit of Netfosa, um, which is just downstream of Elkhart, Indiana, but I'm not sure what to make of that yet. And um, based on the land used in the highly industrialized area in northwest part of the state, I was honestly expecting to see a different, um, different mixtures in that region of the state, but it seems pretty consistent with uh, the more rural areas. But uh, once we have all the data, we'll be able to take a better look and see if there are any differences based on those land uses. And that's all I have for the sampling analysis portion. All right, and I focused on the second portion of this grant, uh, which is aimed at education and outreach. Our goal is to provide consumption information uh, to sensitive populations in order to maximize the health benefits of eating fish while also minimizing the health risks associated with the contaminants that may be present in the fish. 
And to do this, we are in the process of developing five outreach materials directed to a variety of audiences. And when the materials are all completed and approved, they'll be distributed to different locations in the Great Lakes Basin that will serve these populations. So we'll send them to places like doctor offices, grocery stores, DNR sites, bait shops, uh, places like these. And our first educational material is a regional brochure, uh, which is covering the Indiana portion of the Great Lakes Basin. It'll contain information on fish consumption, general and sensitive population guidelines for locally caught fish, and a map of the basin. Uh, we're really looking to target anyone consuming fish in these regions. And the second material we're creating is an angler sticker, uh, which can be kept on or in a tackle box, and it's designed to look like a ruler while also containing information on fish preparation and where to find local guidelines. And anglers are the main target for this material. And our third item is an information card, which can be kept in a wallet or a purse um, or a bag. And it contains updated fish consumption information that will replace the current set of wallet cards uh, we hand out to different events. And the main target for these are women of childbearing age. And the last two items, they go together. We are creating a poster containing information on health benefits and risks and commercial fish tips, along with a handout containing similar information um, with a few activities for younger children to complete, like word searches, mazes, and some coloring too. So we're hoping that'll be fun for them. Uh, we're looking at targeting the whole family with these and getting everybody incorporated um, into the information. Uh, but along with these five outreach and education materials, we're also creating an angler survey. Uh, we're hoping to determine frequently consumed fish species uh, within the Great Lakes Basin yep. and to learn more about the consumption habits of the anglers. And with the information we collect, we're really hoping to identify data gaps in consumption guidelines and to develop outreach targeted specifically to anglers and their families. And here's some contact information for you all. And that concludes our presentation. You're on mute, Wayne. Thanks, Allie and Grace. Yeah. Uh, while we wait for Wayne, let's just go ahead and get started with the next group. Uh, Wisconsin, go ahead. Sure, can you hear me, Jill? Hey, can you hear me there? Yep, we can. Go ahead. Perfect, thank you. All right, I'm going to share my screen here and get us started, and then we'll be uh, I'm handing it over to Amanda Haven as well, who's our new program manager. So uh, kind of two quick things we wanted to touch on. I know we only have a few minutes this morning is kind of some of the information sharing and the work we did around our previous project with CDC, um, specifically related to sport fish consumption among Burmese uh, immigrants and refugees living here in Milwaukee. And then we'll hand it over to Amanda Haven, our new uh, project manager, who will talk about our current EPA project, which is very heavily informed by uh, our previous work with the Burmese. So we've presented on this before, so I just wanted to get a few highlights um, of, of the work we've done and we're continuing to do with some of this data we gathered a few years ago. Uh, we did have a manuscript uh, published a little bit earlier this year uh, describing kind of the consumption, uh, fish consumption and uh, uh, advisory awareness among Burmese uh, immigrants living in the Milwaukee area. Um, so this is a kind of a nice overview of how we 
use this uh, sampling approach to reach a population that's typically um, traditionally very hard to, to, to reach. So kind of the high level background, we do have a quite a, a large Burmese community living here in Wisconsin, over 6,000, the vast majority of those do live in Milwaukee County in the Southeast portion of the state. And that, that area of Milwaukee County and the estuary is one of the uh, EPA, or the, one of the Great Lakes areas of concern. So there's a lot of historical contamination there, PCBs and methyl mercury. Uh, that impacts a lot of the water bodies there where a lot of the uh, Burmese uh, immigrants uh, fish and consume fish. So it was a, this was a kind of a high priority area uh, given both kind of cultural high fish consumption practices and uh, the risk posed by the environment that they were um, angling in. So the, our questionnaire was really divided into getting a better sense of what the level of fish consumption is among this group. Uh, as well as their awareness of fish advisories. So it was really twofold. As I mentioned, we use respondent-driven sampling where each person who responds in turn tries to recruit three more people to respond to the survey. And it branches out over time. And in that uh, manuscript I showed at the beginning, there's a nice diagram of how that worked. And, and this worked uh, very well to help get a lot of respondents and generate uh, a large enough sample size to generate some valid data. So on average, um, fish consumption among the Burmese were very high, about 64 meals per year. Um, interestingly, unlike some of our other angling surveys, uh, nearly 40% of the respondents were women of childbearing age and they consumed, who consumed king mackerel, uh, tile fish, stored fish, or shark. So a, a lot of uh, consumption of highly contaminated fish species among uh, Burmese women of childbearing age. Um, and, you know, of those women who did consume these high contaminant fish, the uh, vast majority live with young children as well. So there's potential for sharing of that food uh, with the other vulnerable populations in the household. So indicated that we had, um, you know, clearly some work to do to make sure that our education and outreach got out there to this community. Uh, unfortunately, uh, very small proportion, about 10%, had ever heard of the Safe Fish Eating Guidelines uh, for Wisconsin, and even fewer than that had heard about those the guidelines specifically the Milwaukee uh, area of concern. Um, when we asked about any changes they made uh, to avoid fish contaminants, um, over half didn't make any changes. Most didn't try to eat different fish species. They didn't try different fishing locations. They didn't avoid eating certain fish um, parts or even reducing their consumption. That's really unsurprising, um, seeing the low levels of advisory awareness among this uh, community. So the quick takeaways from this um, is, you know, this is a community that is potentially very highly exposed. There is an associated biomonitoring component to this project with CDC and, and measure methylmercury uh, persistent pesticides and PFAS that we can talk about in a future meeting. Um, but they did have very high levels of consumption and very few were aware of fish advisories. Um, and that really provided kind of the foundation for the work we're doing now uh, with EPA. And that work will also be using respondent driven sampling, which was very successful um, before. So coming up, you know, uh, over the last year, uh, we're continuing to work on uh, some other manuscripts from that project we did with CDC. We have a uh, one uh, on the licensed angler portion of that project that we're currently working on with CDC. Uh, we also have the point in time survey, which we presented on previously, that is in, in review for for publication in a peer reviewed manuscript, and also have a uh, brief of, uh, of fish consumption in Wisconsin uh, that, that is also being. Uh, under review for publication. Um, uh, Xiaofei He, who you may have um, met on previous calls, she is uh, she has departed. You may know she isn't here. She's moved on to a, a job in the private sector, and we will we will miss her very much. Um, and we're currently actively recruiting for a new epidemiologist uh, for uh, to take her place here. So, given they only have a limited amount of time, I wanted to kind of do uh, go through this to set a bit of a foundation for. Uh, and Haven, who will be talking about the work we're currently doing with EPA. So I will stop sharing and turn it over to you, Amanda. Thanks, John. 
make sure. Let's see. Um, Sorry, give me a second. <laughs> okay, can you see that okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so our current project that we're working on right now with the EPA uh, has a very long title, but it's so it's the sport fish consumption among Asian women of childbearing age in the Milwaukee area of concern, reducing contaminant exposures through targeted outreach and education. Uh, and so obviously that's way too long for our participants um, when we're presenting our project to them. So we abbreviated it for purposes of um, reaching out to participants as stay healthy by eating fish safely. Some background for this project. So uh, previously, you know, as John mentioned, Milwaukee is home to many recent immigrants from Asia who have um, eat high amounts of fish. And our previous Burmese project showed that high levels of persistent environmental pollutants um, are among Burmese, as well as the low awareness of fish advisories. And so that's particularly a concern among women of childbearing age. Um, and then also within the different Asian ethnic groups, uh, fish eating habits and exposures are not well understood. And so our intent for this project is to develop some culturally appropriate outreach and educational materials based on the information that we gather from these groups. Um, and our specific targeted groups for this project are the Chinese, Filipino, Hmong, and Korean um, groups within the Milwaukee area of concern to help reduce their harmful exposures to sport fish consumption. So our three specific aims for this project are to understand fish consumption habits and assess fish advisory awareness. We'll be doing that through focus group sessions and a targeted cross-sectional survey. Our second aim is to identify strategies to increase healthy fish consumption through a behavioral intervention. And then our last aim is to develop those culturally appropriate um, outreach and educational materials, which we'll have um, community members review. So for the first aim, we have completed three out of our four two hour focus group sessions. We recruited six to seven women of childbearing age from the Chinese Hmong and Korean um, groups, and that was using snow, a snowball method with the help of our community advisory group. Um, and women were deemed eligible if they were a woman between 18 and 50 years old from one of our target ethnicities. Um, they need to uh, be able to either speak English or their ethnic groups appropriate language. For the Chinese and Korean sessions, they must have immigrated or moved to the US within the last 10 years. And then everyone must have lived in the greater Milwaukee area for one year or longer, uh, which was defined for us as areas within Milwaukee County. And then also everyone must eat fish caught from local water, bo water bodies at least four times per year, either by themselves or someone that they know. And um, specifically for uh, the Hmong, Chinese and Filipino groups, we requested that they have access to reliable internet and an email address or a working laptop or computer. Um, this criteria was initially modified for the Korean group, which where they could have met in person if they needed to um, at one of our external partners office buildings, but that actually wasn't needed because of COVID. All of our participants actually had access to a tablet um, and Zoom through their child's school. So we actually were able to do the Korean focus group um, through Zoom as well. Um, our moderators for each session were trained community members who spoke their assigned ethnic groups language as well as English. Um, and then currently we're beginning our analysis from these three completed sessions and um, what the discussions reveal in regards to the cultural beliefs, attitudes, and environmental factors that promote or discourage safe fish consumption. Uh, we will be continuing recruitment to complete the Filipino focus group in early 2022. We have had some difficulty with recruitment. Uh, one of the main barriers uh, from women we've been connecting with is finding women who actually eat locally caught fish four times per year. And then our current phase right now is our cross-sectional phone survey. Uh, we will be utilizing the respondent-driven sampling methods again that we refined in our previous project, and we'll be using three identified initial seeds or participants from each group. Um, eligibility is pretty much the same as the focus group sessions, um, except for 
um, we reduced the amount of, of fish meals. So in the last year, the uh, women need to have eaten at least one meal of fish, um, and then and that would be from any water body in Wisconsin, not just in the Milwaukee area. Um, and then, so right now we're currently finalizing our interviewer training documents and our workflow documents for them to use. We'll be training two interviewers per ethnic group who speak English as well as uh, Hmong, Karin, or Mandarin. Uh, the, all the uh, Filipino participants will be um, speaking English for their surveys. And the survey itself was created um, from findings from our focus groups as well as our previous Burmese project. And so our goal is to recruit 200 uh, women of childbearing age across all four ethnicities, and uh, we're balancing that, so hopefully about 50 per group. Uh, again, the questionnaire will have uh, consist of questions related to fish consumption habits as well as fish um, advisory awareness. So this is just a diagram of our uh, interview workflow, which I'll just briefly go over. So a participant will receive an invitation. So for the Korean group, everything will be mailed and then the other groups, everything will be electronic. So um, either in the mail, they'll receive an invite for the Korean, they'll complete it and mail it back to us. Participants um, for the other three groups will receive uh, an email. The initial C's will receive an email link and they'll click on the invite completed in which is in red cap for us. Uh, we'll review the data and then uh, mark whether the participant is eligible or not um, based on our review. And then the interviewers will call the participant um, and go through our um, different forms that we have set up in red cap to confirm participant info, um, eligibility confirmation, and then do the actual survey questionnaire. And all that will be done by phone, but the interviewer will be completing the data in red cap. Uh, we'll review the data and at, for the electronic participants when they complete the um, phone survey, uh, they will actually receive an automatic email saying with their completion. And then in that email, it's going to ask them to actually recruit three other women with the actual survey invite link that they originally did themselves. Um, and then for the male participants for the CRIN group, they will receive their thank you in the mail and it will have recruitment packets in the mail for them to send out um, to other per three women um, participants as well. Um, our second uh, aim is the strategies to increase safe fish consumption. And so the third part of our project will be doing this uh, behavioral intervention um, to measure the effectiveness of self-affirmation strategy in promoting message acceptance and behavioral changes of safe fish consumption. Uh, and to integrate this strategy, if it's proved to be effective, um, we'll, it will help us in designing our outreach and educational materials. Um, so it's been found that self-affirmation not only reduces disagreement that challenges self-integrity, but also reduces defensive responses to health messages. So we'll be recruiting 76 participants balanced again across all four groups. Uh, one group will receive the self-affirmations with messaging on fish advisories, and the other group will only receive messaging on fish advisories. And then we'll do a one month follow up to measure any changes to fish consumption habits. Just so this another is, minute, Amanda, OK? OK, thank you. Thanks. Yep. And so for the self affirmation group, um, this is just a diagram to show that um, where they will just be receiving or excuse me, the standard messaging group will only be receiving the safe fish consumption. So we do expect participants who receive self affirmation intervention to have more positive attitudes towards the uh, advisories um, and stronger behavioral intentions of adhering to them. Um, and then our final uh, outcome or part of this project is we're going to be developing culturally appropriate outreach and educational materials, which will be informed by um, the first phases of our project. And we'll be developing and testing those new materials with members um, from each ethnicity. And then I just want to um, mention our external partners real quick. We do have a community advisor group, which um, we have four community representatives from each target group that are helping us with uh, feedback on project design and implementation. IIW uh, is helping us with translation services, um, as well as helping us with recruitment and connecting us to the community. And then the UW Survey Center um, is helping us with training our interviewers and moderators. And so this is just to wrap up um, project benefits. We're hoping to make this impact um, on the individual community and policy environment level um, with you know, increasing safe fish consumption with individuals 
community, empowering them um, to, and uh, to identify inequitable conditions around safe fish consumption and then the policy environment to understand um, cultural practices and building the importance of this health issue um, on the public's agenda. And, uh, oh. Okay, thank you. Um, so I did, I, I, I got muted somehow and um, did Justin Earlham get skipped or what, what happened with that? Yeah, yeah Reed, I, I did think it real we... quick if we got time. Yes, I'm sorry? please do. I'm sorry about that. You know, the little fine print on the agenda. I missed you, Justin. So go ahead, please. That's no problem. Presentation is trying to load up right now. Okay, can everybody see the slide? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so my name is Justin Earlham I'm with the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency, and uh, I'm going to give uh, our PFOS updates as they relate to our GLRI grant. So thanks to Jackie Fisher and a lot of preliminary efforts and ongoing efforts by Brian Cook, um, Illinois has been awarded $350,000 uh, in GLR funding. Um, the project that we're planning on doing is to PFOS and fish tissue um, from samples caught in the uh, Lake Michigan open waters and basin area uh, as it borders Illinois. Um, what's unique about this grant is uh, the entire amount is going to be used to purchase lab equipment uh, that's capable of analyzing PFOS and fish tissue. Um, according to what Jackie had told me, this is uh, the first time that uh, grant funding has uh, allowed the purchase of equipment from for uh, states that have received the grant. Uh, so the equipment will be permanently housed at the IEPA lab here in Springfield, Illinois. And um, we uh, plan on using it quite a bit for fish tissue analysis. Um, so our work plan first is to purchase and install the equipment. Um, that's taken longer than we thought it was going to, but uh, this is my first time with one of these purchases and um, we'll, uh, we'll get it here soon enough, I think, though, uh, to do the sampling and analysis that we need uh, in a reasonable amount of time. So our second step is to uh, develop SOPs for sampling, extraction, and analysis of fish tissue. Um, we plan on using the method 1633 uh, for analysis. Um, of course, right now it's in the draft form, um, but hopefully we can still use it as we need to um, and have the samples still analyzed in time. Uh, next step is to draft the quality assurance project plan and uh, it will need to be reviewed by Glenn Poe. Um, and the, the plan is to collect um, 100 composite fish samples. Um, we want to go with 10 inland stations and 10 open water stations uh, within the Lake Michigan Basin. Um, we'd like to conduct the sampling over a two-year period, which will be 2022 and 2023 and we'll analyze all the samples uh, for PFOS. Um, the results we get are going to be compared to the uh, consortium's best practice guidelines. And uh, of course, the data will be shared with Glenn Poe and consortium members and uh, used to issue advisories if we need to. 
So as of right now, I uh, just or I, I submitted the work plan um, on five six of twenty one. Uh, we add, submitted the application um, shortly after that on the twentieth. Um, funds were available as of July sixth, and uh, like I said, we're still in the process of trying to obtain the equipment. Um, I heard one estimate that it would be a year, but it's uh, proving to be sooner than that. Um, and the QAP was just recently submitted on uh, the 30th of last month, and it is currently in Glenpoe Review. And this is our proposed work schedule that was included with the QAP. Um, we're we're a little bit behind on these uh, these first two goals, um, but you know I think we'll be able to catch up and still have the end result uh, in the time that we want to. And this is a uh, list of the stations that we're planning on sampling. Um, <clears throat> I tried to include you know as much area as possible um, along the whole border of Illinois. And these are the species that we're hoping to collect. Um, one that's not on here is burbot. Um, I'd like to try to request those after uh, hearing what Sean uh, Strom had to say about some results from burbot. So um, I will probably add those to our request. Um, so that's all I have. If there's uh, any questions, I can take them now or during the discussion. Okay, thanks. Well, discussion is up next, I think. So uh, let's start with any questions for Justin. Hi, Wayne. This is Sherry Barish. I guess I have a, a question. Um, Justin, you said you were going to use the new um, method to um, analyze for PFAS. I guess I'm curious. Um, we basically use that a similar or same method in our fish tissue uh, monitoring studies under the National Aquatic Resource Surveys and at EPA under the uh, fish tissue monitoring program. And we are able to use basically that same method to get uh, increase from 13 different PFAS to now I think up to about 40 PFAS. And there are about six that we find regularly. Some of those same ones that Wayne was showing on his slides like PFUNA, PFDOA. And I guess I'm curious if you guys would um, or if you're going to, because it's all the same method, have them analyzed for some additional PFAS that might be found in fish beside PFAS. I do want to do that eventually. Um, I'm not sure that we'll include that with the GLRI project. Um, I may, if, if uh, employee staff and funding is available, um, you know, I may try to include that, but it would be a separate deal from GLRI. Um, the main reason I picked PFOS was because the consortium has the guidance for it, uh, for meal advice. And, um, you know, as more advice, more meal advice comes out for, uh, for other chemicals, you know, we're definitely going to include those. And, um, uh, later on, you know, once we get, uh, the equipment established and, um, prove that you know we can use it and everything works right then we can uh, I'd like to include other PFAS for monitoring as well so I have a question for you Justin um, so is the analytical uh, work because you said the whole grant is paying just for the equipment so are you are you paying for the reagents and all that stuff out of your routine budget Uh, yes, I I know Illinois will be paying for that, um, but I, I don't know which budget it will come out of. If it'll be the FCMP budget or another uh, grant that was obtained by uh, another bureau or something. Um, but yes, the the equipment will be um, actually, I guess, the partial a portion of the equipment will be paid for by the grant. Um, that's of course more expensive than the three hundred fifty thousand that's going to be funded. Um, so Illinois will cover uh, the other portion of that too. 
Okay, good. Other questions for Justin? Um, hearing none, let me come back to uh, Sherry's question for me, which had to do with, I think, sort of track down. So our, our data flow has typically been that the data go to the health department and to the fisheries folks who collected the fish. And with PFAS, we've also added our environmental remediation program to the data flow. So any, any PFAS results in fish now go to them. And how, since that's relatively new, how we're going to actually work out, like, uh, do, do we need to look into that? I, I think it's still a work in progress for us. Uh, this is Tony Forty. I just want to say that, Ed, that um, we talked about the source of the uh, Peconic River PFAS, PFAS compounds uh, with our Bureau of Environmental Exposure Investigation. Uh, in, within a health department. And they say that they do know that there are a lot of private wells in that vicinity with PFAS contamination. And so that's as much as we know so far from that. And I, I, we found that out. And uh, just getting back to PFU and A toxicity, uh, we are actually, some of our tox staff at DOH are, have been looking at this issue. Uh, you know, the, the question is, you know, is PFU and A toxicity uh, mechanism similar enough that it should be additive to uh, PFOS in terms of risk assessment. And um, so we got folks looking into that. And when we find something out, I, you know, well, probably just let the group know what, what they've decided. They've been doing a big literature search. So uh, stay tuned. Any other comments in um, general now? Let's just open this up. Yeah, hi, this is Henry. From New York. I had a comment or question for John and Grace. Um, I thought the presentations were really interesting. John, you mentioned that the Burmese had high rates of consumption of commercial fish, like tilefish and shark, which are high in mercury. Did you get a sense of from your work so far as to whether or not Sport fish consumption played a major role in, in their mercury levels compared to, or mercury or other contaminants compared to commercial fish, sport fish versus commercial. Sorry, this is Amanda. Um, John had to hop off and um, I cannot answer that question because this was before my time. So um, okay. I, I can ask him that and um, have him respond. All right, thank you. I have a question for Allie. Um, this is Brian from Illinois. Uh, I don't know if you want to pull up that slide, but you showed some of your data for PFOS and, and other PFAS analytes in the Lake Michigan species. And I, I guess I was somewhat surprised at how low the concentrations were, given that some of those species are just thinking about mercury and PCBs. Uh, Chinook salmon, for example, tend to have a lot of mercury or PCBs. I'm just wondering, do you have a estimate on the sizes, the size distribution of those uh, organisms that were analyzed? Um, we do have that data. I don't know off the top of my head, but the way we collect salmonids from Lake Michigan is we always get three size classes and then a replicate of each size class. Um, so for each species, a sampling event uh, would be 18 different fish and six different samples. So um, the idea is always to, um, you know, cover the entire size class of legally caught fish. Um, so I think uh, I think that data is representative of the largest size class as well as the smaller size classes. 
Okay, it's good to know because we do have some do not eat advisories for the, some of the larger salmonids. I just want to make sure that those larger salmonids were actually being sampled as part of this. Yep, they are. Uh, this is John Wathen. If I may jump in here and report back on the thing we were talking about at the uh, at the beginning of the call, and that is uh, the um, uh, the methylmercury um, selenium relationship. I did check with our uh, folks in in uh, Office of Research and Development that are working on revisiting the methylmercury reference dose, and uh, they uh, do not have any conclusions now, but they are working on that question and will have results uh, at the time that they produce the re reference dose, which I believe uh, will be in 2023. But they, they are considering that question and expect to have uh, uh, thoughts on it. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, this is Pat. Um, Wayne, you brought up the best practice for um, mixtures. And I just wanted to remind people that as it stands right now, we had discussed not adding analytes together to determine an advisory unless their mechanism of action were the same or close, I guess. So that's the way it stands right now. And I just wanted to add that as relates to all these other analytes that um, are showing up in fish, that um, it's possible that we would, or that you would need other reference doses developed for those analytes rather than just adding them to PFOS, unless you want to change the approach to mixtures that um, was established earlier. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, you know, I realize that the question, you know, and I, I just put those sums in because I, I really don't know um, what what to do here with that. I mean, it's you know we don't have reference doses. We don't know if they're additive. On the other hand, uh, so the question is, what what do you do in the absence of knowledge? Yeah, I, right. this, that yeah. wasn't I wasn't referring to your um, addition. I was just making a comment to remind people that that's that's the way it stands right now. Yeah, yeah we thanks. <laughs> At DOH, when we questions have come up, we as a screening approach, we sometimes do this, and a lot of times the sums are less than the RFD in question, and so we just, you know, just as a screening approach, so we know, and and, it's, and, it, and it never came up with PFOS before, but now this PFUNA business um, has made us di dive into it deeper. Uh, that's all. So yeah, I think you're. Right. I mean, it's true though about the common mechanism of action. That's something that we certainly are looking at. And this is Sherry Barish at EPA. I'll just mention that um, I think part of the agency's PFAS roadmap that you can find on our website is to try to figure out some of that for the different PFAS to see if there are, you know, ways to look at them um, as mixtures or, um, you know, I don't know, like additive um, toxicity um, and, uh, you know, like combined toxicity. Um, and then I think uh, you know, maybe breaking them down into groupings um, and, and doing values, toxicity values for certain groupings. So I think um, if people look at that um, PFAS roadmap, I think there's a discussion on the research about trying to figure that out here, just especially because they're potentially not necessarily all in fish, um, but there's so many chemicals um, that people are dealing with. Hi, uh, Satyendra from Ontario. Uh, just yeah, just a quick comment on this uh, topic of mixtures. So as Pat mentioned, we do have. Uh, I, Pat can correct me. I'm not sure if we finalize a BMP and, and has it available, but that was the the opinion. Uh, just to clarify that this is the, when we talk about mixture, it's typically for different. Uh, classes of analytes, so it's like mercury and PCB or mercury, PCB and PFAS or PCB and PFAS, that kind of mixture we were talking, at least at that point. Um, 
I'm sure like we all recognize that to be in particular class, there have been some mixture considerations. So for example, for dioxins, you know, we do use uh, a toxic equivalent concentration to consider the mixture of dioxins, furans and dioxin like PCBs. Uh, mixture of PFAS has always, uh, well, it has been uh, an uncertainty, uh, at least till now. Uh, thanks, Shari, for highlighting that it is available in the roadmap. So at least I'll have a uh, look at that. And, uh, you know, consortium members, if we can all have a look and uh, at some point, maybe as necessary, we can make revisions to our BMP on chemical mixtures, specifically just discussing on the PFAS part, I guess, at least. Thank you. One other uh, point to be aware of is that although I mean, there's the, there's the mixtures issue, but then there's also the toxicity of PFOS itself, which, you know, the, the science keeps evolving or the, you know, the toxicity values um, have been, there, there have been multiple toxicity values that have come out over the years. And uh, apparently the science advisory board for EPA IRIS recommends much, much lower RFD at the moment. So it's just something to be aware of. Of course, that's um, it's, it's, it doesn't account for the benefits, for example, that we uh, consider in, for fish consumption. But so just mixtures is one issue, but then the science behind PFOS toxicity is another uh, to consider going forward. <laughs> Okay, so we have about one minute left in this session. If so, a last comment or two from anyone? So, okay, well, thanks for this discussion. So we will then resume at 40 minutes past the hour. So we'll have about a 10 minute break and that'll be starting up with uh, Minnesota with Bruce and Summer. So thanks, and we'll, we'll just have a 10 minute break here. Thanks.
All right. Well, welcome back. Our break has concluded. Uh, Bruce and Summer, are you folks ready to start up? Sure. Uh, this is going to be really brief. I don't have any slides prepared or anything like that. Um, and I'm here too, if, if there's any other questions, but I'm going to let Summer handle this for the Superior <laughs> Basin sampling. Thank you, Bruce. Well, the, the collections are done. We ended up with about 300 fish, which is quite a few less than we had hoped to get. Um, but we've run into some real serious problems with shipping our fish to Canada. And when I say that, I mean we can't ship our fish to Canada at this time. Uh, there have been some changes with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency's rules about fish importation. And so I've had to scramble a bit to try and figure out what to do with these fish. And um, right now we're planning on sending them to the Wisconsin State Laboratory of Hygiene for analysis, um, which is great. It's nice to have that option, uh, but they are also quite backlogged. And so we don't anticipate having all of our data back until uh, February of 2023. And that's about all I can tell you right now. <laughs> that's it. Okay, that's it. Is that is that all from Minnesota that you folks have? Do we want to? Um, is that it? I guess I could just add that in addition to what Summer is uh, coordinating for the S S Superior Basin, we're also getting fish collected, you know, throughout the state um, for P PFAS and we're in the same, of course, the same situation. We've got about 200 samples that have been processed in our lab at, 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 uh, by the DNR. So we actually have homogenous to send, so we're hoping we, we might be able to send those, even though it seems like we've been having trouble with the whole fish. So we're still planning, I'm still planning on sending them to Access, so we'll see what happens. Okay. Um, all right. So, should we move on to Sean and Wisconsin? Yep, I'm here. Okay, um, good. I will try to share my screen. All right, can you see that? Yep, it's, yep, that looks good. Okay, great. So um, my update is gonna be also fairly brief, partially uh, um, intentional, just so to leave a little bit more time for discussion. So this is currently a map of where we currently have PFOS-based uh, consumption advice. Um, the kind of the, the yellowish orange uh, outlines are water bodies where there is PFOS specific advice. Um, this year we expanded uh, the Madison area chain of lakes advisory to space <laughs> on additional analysis. Um, we've added some on the Wisconsin river, which is the big kind of river that kind of flows was right down the middle of our state. Um, we knew from our wildlife monitoring that there's fairly high levels of PFOS throughout the entire river stretch. We don't know the source, um, but uh, we continue to go kind of impoundment by impoundment uh, analyzing fish. And we also had a, a trout stream near uh, a military base um, that had fairly high levels in both brook and brown trout. So just to kind of go into, um, I think I presented this at one of the past meetings regarding our Lake Superior monitoring. So Wisconsin um, does kind of a comprehensive monitoring of Lake Superior fish every four years. And so the last uh, sampling was in 2019 and that's where the rainbow smelt were collected that came back um, fairly high um, PFOS levels. Um, so all, all the other species were fairly low, but the rainbow smelt for some reason 
came back rather high. And so we uh, issued a, a one meal a month uh, advisory, which was a fairly big jump because uh, rainbow smelt were one of the few species in the state where there was no advisory. So it was unrestricted for, for all age groups. So um, this was a, a fairly significant jump, especially considering the popularity of uh, the smelt fishery um, in the Wisconsin waters of Lake Superior. So this is where the 2019 sampling occurred, um, collected off of Port Wing, Wisconsin, and then some around the Apostle Islands. So these smelt results kind of uh, started a, a kind of an avalanche of activity within our department. Um, our environmental management division um, did a lot of surface water sampling to try to determine any potential sources. Um, all of the water samples came back with very low levels of PFAS, so really weren't able to identify any, any specific source. Uh, I think they're still doing some sediment sampling, but as of right now, um, still have not identified any source. We do still have some outstanding samples from walleye and yellow perch, so those kind of nearshore species that we're going to be interested in getting those results back. And then um, this year, so 2021, uh, we collected additional smelt samples from Lake Superior. And um, this is kind of a washed out map, and I apologize for that, but um, we tried to get them from kind of a, a broad range of Wisconsin's Lake Superior waters. The, the size of the blue dots is reflective of how many samples were collected. So I think there was 30-ish smelt collected. Uh, most of them, or higher proportion of those, were collected near Superior, Wisconsin, which is kind of at the end of, of Lake Superior there, um, and then kind of scattered throughout the South Shore and also into the Apostle Islands. Um, so those were collected, like I said, in, uh, this year, but we don't expect results back from those until sometime well into 2022. So that'll just be kind of a, a stay tuned um, issue. And then the last thing I kind of want to touch upon on are some results that we got from Lake Michigan fish that were actually collected a few years ago. I just got these results back about two weeks ago and I was out most of out of the office most of last week. So I really haven't gotten to do any sort of a deep dive into the, the data. But the most interesting results were what we observed for, for burbot. And as you will see, the, the numbers on each of the bars is, is the sample size. And so, you know, fully admit that our sample sizes are very low, but uh, these are still very interesting observations. Um, you know, uh, especially for Wisconsin where the burbot fishery is really growing in popularity where um, there's a, uh, kind of a, a demographic of anglers that really seek out burbot. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting observation and something that will kind of guide our future sampling of Lake Michigan fish. Um, similar to, to Allie's presentation, you know, I, I haven't done any sort of a deep dive into the data, but one ob observation just kind of qualitatively is that there were far more detects of other PFAS species in these Lake Michigan uh, fish compared to what we normally observe with um, our inland fish sampling. Um, so that, that's kind of an interesting observation that, you know, we detect far more uh, P, different PFAS compounds compared to inland species. Um, you know, uh, comparatively looking uh, at other Great Lakes waters, it certainly seems like some of the salmonids have lower levels. So coho and, and Chinook salmon seem to have lower levels. Um, the rainbow trout, again, there's only two samples, fairly high levels, but those two samples, one was collected just off of Milwaukee and the other was off of Racine. So, you know, those are fairly um, urban industrialized areas. So whether or not that has any input, we don't know, but you know, we'll obviously be collecting additional rainbow trout along with burbot. And the interesting thing with the burbot, 
is, and I, I apologize for the quality of, of this map. I need to find a better map of Lake Michigan sampling grids, but the, the burbit that were analyzed were collected. Um, if you can see in sampling grids 706 and 806, which are um, just near where uh, the, the, the town of Bailey's Harbor, which is in the Door County Peninsula. And if you're not familiar with Wisconsin geography, the Door County Peninsula is the piece of land that shoots out and kind of separates um, the Bay of Green Bay uh, and the rest of, of, of Lake Michigan. And the interesting thing is there's really no industry up there. I mean, it's it's all fairly rural. Um, lots of it's a high tourist area, um, lots of fruit orchards and agriculture, but no real heavy industry. And I, to be 100 percent honest, I don't know a whole lot about the life history of Burbit. I don't know how much they move around, um, but uh, it from where these were collected, there was certainly no uh, source in, in close proximity. And so, you know, in addition to trying to get some additional burbot up in this area, um, we'll probably try to get some from other areas of Lake Michigan as well. And um, I'll just add kind of backing up a little bit that we did collect, um, I mentioned about how we collected additional smelt in Lake Superior um, we did collect additional smelt in both the Bay of Green Bay and then the northern part of Lake Michigan and the southern part of Lake Michigan. And so again, those we won't get results back for those until probably well into 2022. But um, hopefully if we can ever get together in person again, I might have those results <laughs> available. Um, and that's it. That's actually all I have. Um, my contact information if, if anybody needs it. Um, so I said I, it's really quick, really fast, but um, I was hoping to leave a lot of time for discussion. Okay, well, thanks. Um, boy, you're just finding one hot species after another. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of those things that's like you keep looking, you're going to find it at some point. Yeah, so I, I, you know, I think we'll save for discussion, but I think this just really points out how we are very much still in the age of exploration. Uh, so we'll, we'll keep with the plan for saving discussion for a discussion period and move on to Michigan. So that would be Lisa and Brandon. Hi, hey, Wayne, this is Brandon. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, great, thanks. Okay, so showing up? Yes. Okay. Great. Okay, still good? Looks yes. Good. Yep, all good. Great. All right. Um, so this is the uh, program update for Michigan um, with the, fish, the Michigan Fish Consumption Advisory Program. Um, that program is led by Lisa Fisher and myself, um, and we're assisted by Brandon Armstrong of Eagle, who is the fish contaminant monitoring program lead over there. Um, and each of us are going to uh, talk a little bit for our program update today. Um, so starting with an overview, we're going to talk about our 2021 Eat Safe Fish guide. Um, we're going to talk about kind of what we're doing for future Eat Safe Fish guides and updates. Um, then Lisa's going to talk about um, our ongoing review of the reference dose that we use for PFOS and setting our PFOS fish consumption guidelines. Um, Lisa's going to continue talking about our uh, Huron River PFOS advisory as a case study. Then I'm going to jump back in and talk about our Lake Superior Rainbow Smelt PFOS advisory. Um, and then Brandon's, uh, Brandon Armstrong is going to uh, talk about some preliminary smelt PFOS results that um, have been collected in uh, Lake Superior, Lake Huron, and some inland lakes. So starting with our uh, Eat Safe Fish Guide updates, um, uh, just as a reminder, our Eat Safe Fish Guide is the, um, the um, document that we release that contains all of the fish consumption guidelines um, that we issue. 
Um, it's updated regularly based on new fish contaminant data and resulting uh, fish consumption advisories. The last update that we issued uh, occurred in 2018, and the next update that we will issue will include all new advisories from 2018 to 2021. That will include uh, over 100 new fish advisories. So those are advisories for fish that did not have any previous um, species and water body specific guidance um, and over 150 total changes um, to existing guidance. So that includes any new advisories as well as any changes to existing guidelines. So um, updates to serving categories, relaxing or restricting, um, changes to driving contaminants, um, what, what contaminant drives the advisory, and any changes to length breaks or um, gu guidelines that vary based on the size of the fish. And we're planning to release um, that 2021 to 2022 Eat Safe Fish Guide uh, in early 2022 as soon as uh, it gets updated and approved by our uh, management and communications. Um, for future Eat Safe Fish Guides, we do want to talk a bit about um, our plans for the future, and that includes um, releasing future guideline updates on a yearly schedule. Um, the last couple of years, it has not been on that yearly schedule, but that's something that we're committed to for, for the future. Um, and in order to kind of support that, we've been exploring new formats to release our Eat Safe Fish guides. Um, we've run into several problems um, just related to the, the format that we use for our guide. It's very time intensive to update and, and to edit. Um, it requires specific um, graphic design experience with InDesign, which is a program that we use, um, and, and that's um, <clears throat> not uh, a skill that's that's very prevalent. We only have one person in our in our department who can use that program well enough to um, to you know in, in a timely fashion. So that's been a really really significant bottleneck in us getting out um, the Eat Safe Fish Guide. So we, we're looking at different ways of hosting those guidelines online, um, maybe a different kind of program that could very easily take, you know, an Excel spreadsheet and turn that into a readable format. Um, but we've been looking at a couple different ways to uh, make sure we can release those guidelines in a more timely fashion. Okay, and Lisa's going to talk about our review of the PFOS reference dose. All right, so I'm Lisa Fisher and I work with um, Brandon Reed with the Eat Safe Fish program. Um, so something that's been ongoing, um, we've kind of been discussing this for about the past year, is um, potentially updating the reference dose that we use for PFOS. Um, we've, we do have um, very active um, citizens in the state of Michigan that, um, you know, regularly bring this um, to our attention. And um, so we are in the process of reviewing what we currently use for our reference dose, um, which currently is different than uh, what the consortium uses. Um, and just trying to see, um, you know, if we need to update that reference dose. Um, it, it was developed back in 2014, so it's a little bit outdated. Um, so right now, Brandon and I are looking at um, critical studies um, and then, you know, whether uncertainty and modifying factors uh, need to be updated as well. So we've been meeting regularly to um, talk about that, and um, we're hoping to send out our preliminary um, thoughts to a couple of internal groups within DHHS. Um, and then once that goes through review, um, eventually have the consortium review it, but that's that's probably a ways out right now. So that's what we're working on with that. And you can move to the next slide. And then um, I'm actually going to be talking about this this afternoon at the um, Great Lakes PFAS Summit. Um, but we are we we issued a, a do not eat fish advisory for the Huron River in southeast Michigan back in 2018. And um, that was based on high levels of PFOS um, in certain water bodies along the Huron River that in some spots um, exceeded a thousand parts per billion. And um, we've also had some surface water samples from from um, a creek, Norton Creek that flows into the Huron River that have had um, high high PFOS levels as well. Um, so back in 2018, we issued a series of um, do not eat fish advisories. And um, since 2018, 
we've been getting data back for different water bodies along the Huron River um, and basically trying to build up a data set um, where we felt that we had enough data to either justify keeping the advisory in place for certain stretches of the river or relaxing that advisory. So in early 2021, um, you know, we we started looking at some data that had come back and, um, you know, we, we decided that um, we felt comfortable lifting um, the do not eat advisory for a lower section of the Huron River. Um, so that's what I'll be talking about this afternoon at the, the PFAS summit. Um, Eagle and um, other state agencies have been looking at um, sources of PFAS along the Huron River since 2018. Um, one of those sources has been identified and is um, currently being mitigated, um, but there are other sources along the river um, where remediation efforts are still ongoing. Next slide. Um, yeah, so we met with Eagle and the DNR um, back in the spring. Um, of course, the Huron River is um, really heavily fished. Um, it's in a large area of Metro Detroit. Um, so there's a pretty large population um, that fishes it. Um, so there's a lot of pressure to kind of um, keep looking at whether the do not eat advisory needs needs to stay in place. Um, so we met with the DNR and Eagle earlier this year to discuss that. Um, and so, like I said, we we kind of developed a plan to look at the data um, for each water body along the Huron River and kind of decide where we still needed more data um, before we could draw any sort of conclusion. Um, and then where we felt comfortable um, relaxing that advisory. So starting in our 2021-2022 guide updates, um, the Do Not Eat Advisory will remain in fact remain in effect for uh, most of the Huron River, but um, will be lifted in part of Wayne County, which is um, towards the, the river mouth to Lake Erie. Next slide. So this just kind of shows you, and I realize it's kind of hard to see um, where the river is on this map, but it kind of starts at the, the North Wixom Road crossing in Oakland County, and then it flows kind of towards the southwest to Baseline Lake, um, which is at the county border of Livingston and Washtenaw counties. And then the river starts to flow southeast um, through Ann Arbor, and then it goes down to the Flat Rock Impoundment and empties into Lake Erie. And I have shown here, um, we, we talked to some aquatic biologists about um, fish movement and decided that where the Huron River crosses um, I-275 would be a good cutoff point for where the do not eat advisory can be lifted. And then we have, um, there are still guidelines in place. They're just not as restrictive as the do not eat. Um, and I think for, um, Sunfish, we still have um, a guideline in place due to the PFOS levels found. Um, but then for some other species, it actually reverts back to other contaminants of concern. So PCBs and dioxins and mercury, because um, there is some um, legacy contamination issues in that section of the Huron River. So um, that's, that's really exciting for us. And um, we're hoping to have a press release with that information go out at the same time that the um, guidelines are are updated on our website. Next slide. OK, thanks, Lisa. Um, so next I'm going to talk about the um, Lake Superior Rainbow Smelt um, guidelines that that we issued. This was um, based on the data that we received from Sean Strom and um, the Wisconsin DNR in January of 2021, um, showing the elevated PFOS levels in smelt in Lake Superior. So um, based on that data, we issued a precautionary fish consumption advisory in March 2021. I think that was actually the first time that we'd ever um, issued a, a guideline solely on data from another state. So that was um, um, that was a nice a nice landmark for us. Um, <clears throat> But um, 
since we issued that advisory, we've been in contact with Eagle and DNR um, and, and USGS, the US Geological Survey, who've collected smelt from seven locations in uh, Lake Superior and its tributaries, um, as well as, um, like I said before, some inland lakes um, and Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. Um, and preliminary results are available for some of those samples, which Brandon Armstrong is going to talk about um, in a couple of minutes. Um, data from these, uh, well, a couple of seconds actually, because I'm finishing up right here. Um, data from these samples will then be used to assign a new fish consumption guideline for Lake Superior smelt. And we're really excited to um, get all that data back and kind of, you know, and, and see what it says about um, the rest of Lake Superior. We've gotten a lot of inquiries about this. We've gotten phone calls. Um, from people asking about the smelt, so um, we're excited to have that data coming in. And I'll pass it off to Brandon Armstrong here. Yeah, thanks, Brandon. So I'm I'm Brandon Armstrong. I, I'm the Fish Contaminant Monitoring Program Coordinator for Eagle in the state of Michigan. And after Wisconsin's data came out, uh, we started reaching out to a lot of groups to figure out how we were going to get smelt collected um, in 2021. So Bay Mills Indian community was able to get fish over on the east side of Lake Superior Forest out of Anquadash Creek. Uh, Keweenaw Bay Indian community uh, got fish through the ice for us in early 2021 out of Keweenaw Bay as well as in Portage Lake by Houghton. And then USGS was doing their surveys throughout the summer. We were able to click, collect some open water samples for us as well as the Michigan Department of Natural Resources I got some fish out of tributaries during the spring smelt spawning season. Next slide. So we processed these fish as headless and gutted individuals, and then 20 individuals were then composited into a sample for each location. There is one exception, uh, the Keweenaw Bay smelt were a little bit larger, so we were able to run a composite sample of 20 fish as well as look at 10 individual samples. Uh, I guess we'll start over on the far west. Um, so any any of the dots that aren't associated with the box, we're still waiting on those data to come back. But starting in Portage Lake, which is in the Keweenaw Peninsula of our upper peninsula, there is a waterway that connects the east side and the west side of Lake Superior. And right down in the middle of that is Portage Lake. And those smelt, again, that was one composite sample of 20 fish, had a PFOS concentration of just under 23 parts per billion. And then in Keweenaw Bay, those that composite sample had a PFOS concentration of 18.1 parts per billion. And those individuals that we analyzed, you can see there's a pretty big range of PFOS in those fish, anywhere from 10 parts per billion up to 89 parts per billion. Um, the average for those 10 individuals was 24 and a half parts per billion and a 95% upper confidence limit of 41.5 parts per billion. And then the last sample result we have for Lake Superior was over on the east side in Anchodash Creek and PFOS was much lower. Uh, that, that one sample had a concentration of 2.8 parts per billion. Um, and then we do have one data point back from Lake Huron. These were collected, actually collected in 2019, and they were sitting in a biologist's freezer for consumption. Uh, so we don't have a size range on those individuals, but uh, the, that sample came back at 15.7 parts per billion PFOS. Next slide. As Brandon mentioned, we did get smelt from two inland lake populations in our lower peninsula. These were collected through the ice in tw early 2021. So Higgins Lake uh, is in the northern part of our lower peninsula. And PFOS concentrations in that lake were higher, nominally higher than what we were seeing up in Lake Superior. It ranged from 27 to 43 parts per billion with an average of 34 parts per billion PFOS. And we did get 60 fish from each of these two lakes, so we ran three composite samples, which is why you see the range there. And then further down to the south is Gull Lake, uh, just north of Kalamazoo, and PFOS was much higher, uh, ranged from 67 to 78 parts per billion with an average of 72.2 or 72 .2 parts per billion. Uh, the interesting thing about Gull Lake is there is a PFAS site 
Uh, we define PFAS sites as anywhere you have contaminated groundwater that uh, exceeds our MCLs for PFAS. So there is a PFAS, PFAS site on the southwest corner of the lake from an old plastics um, manufacturing company. And to date, we haven't had any indication that the plume was reaching Gull Lake. You know, all of our surface water samples were low, less than five parts per trillion PFOS. And it has not shown up at really high concentrations in any of the other game fish species. We've looked at largemouth bass, bluegill, and rock bass from Gull Lake, and you know, nothing would trigger an advisory. So it was pretty surprising that these smelt were, were so high. All right. I think that's all I've got. And just another update is that we are looking at uh, Chinook salmon this year. Uh, we collected them this past fall from Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. So we'll hopefully get those data back by the end of uh, 2022 as well. And then uh, to Sean's point about burbot, we did ask the DNR to collect burbot from the thumb portion of Lake Huron last year. So those those will be processed um, and analyzed in 2022, and we've tacked on PFAS analysis as well. Great, thanks so much, Brynn. And that is our presentation. Happy to take questions now or later or uh, whenever. All right, thanks. So I think in keeping with the plan to hold questions for discussion, uh, we will move on to Yassi Hazan today from New York, who is going to talk about a combined consortium PFAS data set and what we've been finding out um, from from multiple states. So go ahead, Yassi, please. Okay, uh, I'm gonna try to share my screen. Mm, does that look good? Yep, looks good. Okay, um, I'm just start with some background on this project for those who are new or otherwise need a refresher. Um, so back in 20, the 2019 consortium meeting, um, some members of the sampling and analysis group um, decided that with PFAS being such a becoming such a big focus um, in the fish consumption advisory world and with a lot still unknown with uh, about the occurrence of PFAS in fish that it would be useful and beneficial for the consortium to start a um, data sharing project. And this would be developing a shared database in Excel um, that would allow the consortium members with the ability to do so to pull together their data uh, with the purpose of filling data gaps and then doing um, assessments on a regional scale. And this database would then be available on SharePoint um, for the consortium members as a resource. Um, so in addition to doing any sort of analysis or assessment, um, just like for instance, if you find some interesting results and are curious to know if anyone else has seen something similar, uh, you could refer to this database. Um, so uh, within the sampling and analysis group, a smaller number of us uh, formed a PFAS database like sub work group to work on this project. And uh, what we've been doing over the past two years has been developing and finalizing the database structure, uh, standardizing the format, writing up documentation. And then uh, the members who have data available um, and were able to contribute um, worked on preparing and uploading their data. And then I have been doing just some work with the available results um, to do some uh, preliminary uh, summaries. Where we're at now, the database contains results contributed by agencies from New York, uh, Minnesota, Michigan, Indiana, Wisconsin, as well as some uh, data from the EPA's uh, Great Lake uh, Human Health Fish Tissue Study. Uh, and these are from fish collected between 2010 and 2019 from 
358 different water bodies. Uh, this includes uh, water bodies within the Great Lakes Basin, as well as those uh, in the area, but uh, not within the basin itself. So it's uh, not just Great Lakes fish. Uh, so in total, this comes out to be about 128,000 different um, individual observations. The database contains results for about 777, 7,800 um, individual fish, uh, 72 different species of fish, uh, 38 different PFAS analytes, and the results in the database also include coordinates for doing spatial analyses. And we developed a scheme for um, source identification. So if the contributing um, agency knows uh, what the source of PFAS is to a water body, that information can be included in the database. So we can um, you know, do things like uh, compare uh, PFAS occurrence from water bodies with different types of sources or uh, those who, that don't have a known source versus those that do. Um, so what I've started, uh, I'll just now I'll talk a little bit about some of the data summaries I've done with the results in, in the database. Um, I started with looking at um, just PFOS, um, doing a very general look uh, doing uh, means by water body, and this is just including all species and all prep types. Um, so just very sort of wide, wide look. And um, on the left is the histogram that shows the um, average PFOS concentration of fish for um, the num number of water bodies in each range. Um, and we see that the uh, figure is fairly left skewed towards the lower end um, with a few um, water bodies that have uh, quite high average PFOS values up to about uh, 1250 ppb. Um, and then on the right is the ECDF plot, um, which shows the cumulative frequency of water bodies uh, at or below a certain uh, concentration. Uh, so using the 50 ppb as a reference value, since that is the um, lower limit for the one meal a month advisory uh, in the consortium's best practice document, um, about 80% of the water bodies are um, around or below uh, 50 ppb average, and then about 20% of those uh, 358 water bodies are above 50 ppb. And then this is showing the same data, um, except with the water bodies that had a uh, known source identified by the uh, data contributor excluded. Um, so that was about um, like 60 or 70 water bodies. Um, and now on the histogram, we see a similar pattern, um, except m uh, many of those water bodies that had the really high uh, P PFOS uh, values are no longer shown since those uh, do have a known source. And um, on the ECDF plot, um, now maybe around like 86 or 87 um, percent were below the 50 PPB level. And then finally, with this, um, I just took a closer look at that uh, 0 to 50 PPB range. Um, and the histogram here just has a smaller bin width of 2 to get a more resolution um, on some of those lower uh, concentration water bodies. Um, and on the ECDF plot, I am just looking at like 10 PPB, which I believe is the um, like unrestricted um, limit in the consortium best practice document. Um, that would be around like 60% uh, below 40% uh, 
above. Uh, next, I looked at the concentrations of PFOS uh, in fish species collected from the Great Lakes. Um, this was all fish that were prepared as fillets only. Um, so on this figure, the points just represent an individual uh, fish. And with regards to the species, um, the values are sort of what we've come to expect with uh, catfish and the various salmonid species, uh, particularly those from Lake Superior having generally lower values <coughs> for PFOS, um, while the uh, bass, the smallmouth bass, white bass, and the um, perch species have generally higher values. Um, However, generally, um, most do seem to be uh, lower than uh, 50 ppb. Um, and then this is showing the same data, except with the uh, average or mean PFO as shown as the points. Um, and here, looking at the species that have results for um, results collected from like multiple lakes. Um, there's a little bit of like a, a gradient, I guess, with um, the fish from uh, Lake Superior in particular and Lake Huron generally um, being lower in average uh, compared to the upstream lakes, in particular uh, Lake Ontario. So that's all I've done for now. Um, moving forward, things that um, myself and the, um, you know, the PFAS subgroup um, have considered doing is, of course, adding uh, more data as it becomes available, um, maybe looking at a, doing a time series, um, looking at PFOS in some, of the more, uh, in some of the inland waters, and maybe figuring out background concentrations. Um, looking at some of the other long chain PFAS in addition to PFOS, and um, maybe doing some comparisons between lakes and rivers. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. And now, now we have discussion time. Uh, so let's first start is open this up to questions for any any of the folks who just talk or even for folks who spoke before the break? Um, hi, everyone. Satyendra from Ontario again. Um, thanks for sharing all this information on PFAS monitoring. That That's really wonderful. I'm, I'm so glad that, you know, we are generating more information on this topic. So, you know, we have uh, less uh, black boxes <laughs> compared to what we need to know. Uh, good to see that uh, the levels in rainbow smelt, specifically for Lake Superior, are not dramatically high. You know, the initial finding from Wisconsin that Son uh, shared and uh, in the past as well as today, you know, that 60, I think 65, 67 nanogram program uh, did uh, get a fair bit of attention. And uh, as I provided a quick update uh, a couple of weeks ago, like we did some uh, smelt monitoring in, in Lake Superior and the levels were generally low. Um, my feel is that, as it was evident from today's update as well, that these levels would be quite site specific and, and variable considering the size of the, the lake, uh, specifically for Lake Superior. Uh, so it was good to see a um, little bit surprising that not only, you know, the, the Wisconsin part of or at least that one particular site had uh, elevated levels, but there were two, three other sites uh, as well in on the Michigan part. They were a little bit elevated. Um, but yeah, so thanks for sharing all this information. Let's hope that Burbot doesn't really create a, a huge issue. I think I mentioned that in Ontario we have done very uh, limited monitoring of burbot and the levels weren't elevated. I'll have to check, check my notes again, but uh, again, good to, to see the updates coming. Thank you. This is Audrey from New York. Um, 
in regards to the the program update where they were talking about using InDesign and just having not a lot of people um, that are able to use that program. Um, feel free to reach out to Alana and I in New York. Um, we use InDesign as well, and there's a couple workflows that we've used to, you know, especially for our big booklet that is more or less just in table format um, that we use to try to expedite that process. Um, we essentially use an access database to host all of the fish advice and we um, we export it to Excel and then you can essentially just copy and paste it into InDesign, um, which does make it quite a bit faster and a lot more, you know, it, essentially if, if technical people do the background work on the Excel doc, it saves time for the person who has to do the InDesign work. Hey Audrey, this is Brandon from Michigan. We we were talking about that. Thank you. I really I really appreciate that. It, it is a struggle we've been having. So, um, yeah, we may we may we may get in touch and, and see um, more of like kind of like what New York's doing. Sounds good. Hi, this is Sherry Barish at EPA. Um, on the last presentation about the looking at the consortium data collectively, um, that was um, really cool to see. Um, and uh, thanks for including our data. So that's excellent. Um, I guess I had uh, two thoughts, one or a question and a thought. One was I was curious if you guys were thinking about putting that data or maybe it already is in the water quality portal. Um, and then my other question was um, some of you, um, I know Wayne and Pat and some others on this call, remember a time when we were trying to create like a uh, um, fish tissue data template for the portal. Um, and I guess um, I would love to see the um, fields that you guys are collecting in the Excel file um, to make sure that, you know, um, if we move forward to collect um, fish advisory data or if we can make something that makes the portal more simple for you, like for what you're already collecting, um, that would be great. So I guess I'm wondering, um, you don't necessarily have to share the data in Excel file. I guess I'm looking for the the sort of the fields um, in the Excel file. Yeah, I guess um, we'll talk about that at our next sub work group meeting and let, let you know. But I, I guess that that should be a collective decision that we should talk through. Uh, and I, I guess, yeah, I, and I guess I kind of wondered whatever happened with the with the mercury, which we were doing as a pilot. Um, I, I, so, I mean, that that's sort of a side thing. But if if you want to uh, reinvigorate that, maybe give me a shout on that. Sure. I mean, it's li just largely time and resources. Our main lead, um, uh, Samantha Fontanelle, who's on this, was deployed like four times last year because she's a public health service officer. So. COVID just um, took her away a lot, <laughs> so we just sort of lost um, momentum. Yeah, no, I, I kind of figured you were busy, but I mean, I, I have wondered from time to time uh, about trying to get that going. But I'm assuming you guys, in choosing to collect this data, collect, you know, put all this data together, um, have identified like the fields that are important. Um, in doing that. So I think that would be a really um, helpful piece of information. So yeah, I would look forward to you guys talking about it and letting us know if you could um, let us know at least what you guys are, uh, what kind of information you guys are collecting. Yeah, okay, yeah. And we, we did put quite a bit of discussion into that and there there was a fair bit of refinement. I don't, Yasi, do you have more to add on that? Because you were really in the thick of it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't have I don't have a whole lot to add. I was just saying, um, uh, as Wayne was saying, like we definitely took a lot of time to uh, figure out what fields would be uh, important, worthwhile to include. I have, I have one I would call it an anecdotal observation, and it's mo mostly based on 
New York's findings, primarily from Lake Ontario and Niagara River. But my 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 general sense is that although m- most of what we're finding for PFAS in Great Lakes fish is not does not rise to going to a one meal per month, which which is the first most restrictive advice beyond the general advice in New York, that they the the Great Lakes values tend to be a little bit higher than our inland lake values. And I I've I've always found that a little bit puzzling. Uh just kind of wondering how that can be, what the mechanism is. Just throw that out. It's part of, you know, we, we still have a lot to try to figure out with this. Um, Satyendra here from Ontario. Uh, I, that's, a, that's a very good um, observation, Wayne. We are feeling the same way as well. Um, you know, depending on the inland sites, if they are, uh, they have been impacted by, you know, a particular major source such as firefighting training activity. Um, you know, the, in those particular cases, levels could be very high. I don't know if you guys have noticed. I think uh, our highest level that we have noticed was in in excess of six thousand ppb or nanogram per gram. So um, we we didn't see that kind of level in today's presentation, which was good. But at the same time, in general, uh, the levels are typically low uh, at inland locations. So. Uh, there were a couple of uh, inland locations monitored by Michigan uh, for rainbow smelt uh, shared today. Uh, those levels, in in my opinion, were quite elevated. Like I know they were in you know 50, 70 nanogram per gram range. We monitor one location so far for inland uh, for smelt. We have done other uh, species monitored at inland, but for smelt, just one location, and the levels were pretty low. Um, so why the levels could be high or at least higher than inland in general uh, for the Great Lakes. Uh, th- there are a number of potential reasons, um, but one of the major reasons that or, or the major source that we may not anticipate is uh, atmospheric deposition. So there was a presentation at Igler uh, earlier this year which highlighted that atmospheric deposition could be a major source specifically for uh, northern, um, the, like the upper Great Lakes. So, uh, something to keep in mind. Although these, you know, chemicals are quite persistent, we wouldn't expect them to be that volatile. So, atmospheric deposition is typical, typically not considered a major source, but it could be. So, of course, more work need to be done. Good question, Wayne. Thank you, Satyendra. Uh, Sanjay, you I was also going to mention or at least draw your attention that we have a base management practice document uh, prepared for the consortium. Uh, I think we prepared it in 2019, so a couple of years ago, or maybe 18. I know Pat probably is on call, still on call, and, and, and she can correct me. Um, so that particular document uh, was prepared and reviewed by all the consortium members and presented um the current state of knowledge for that time uh, of course you know in general two three years is not a long period but for pfas the science is growing quite rapidly um, however it's still a good document for for our reference uh, one uh, particular point i would like to note here from the reference document or, or i should say base management practice document is um, there are suggested benchmarks for fish consumption advisories now, not all the you know member states and provinces uh, use those benchmarks. Even Ontario hasn't used it, uh, used them either. But we are also considering revisions in the benchmarks, as I uh, mentioned a couple of weeks ago, and we are considering those uh, you know BMP benchmarks. Um, now, uh, Brendan presented at the, the PFAS summit recently, and there was a question. Uh, on this particular topic from one of the attendees that why there are or, or are there are differences in the benchmarks among the Great Lakes states and provinces and if there are why. So, you know, I, I think moving forward, the uh, differences in the benchmarks which would be translating into differences in the advisories uh, could become uh, a major issue. So my particular viewpoint and suggestion to all the members uh, is to, uh, you know, give a hard look at those benchmarks. 
maybe you know at some point in near future we can conduct another round of uh, you know review internal review that if everyone is in agreement with the science or the benchmarks and if not like you know what are the reasons and so we can have at least a good understanding of where we stand and if there is any way to come to a common platform Yep, yeah, I certainly agree with that. Uh, I believe the uh, best practice has something in it about looking at a review within two years, which so it's it's timely. So I, I think we should try to set that up fairly soon. I will work on that. That, that that'll be an action item for us to follow up with. So thanks, thanks for bringing that up. Hi, this is Paul Ramsky. I had a simple question on the smelt for those Wisconsin and Michigan folks. Um, they said they were headless and gutted. Um, was the kidney tissue removed in those samples? Um, for Wisconsin, yes. So all the entrails were removed. Yeah, same for Michigan. We we pulled out everything and then you know rang rang your fingernail up the, along the uh, spinal and cord and pulled everything out. Thanks for that clarification. Well, this is Tony. I just wanted to remind. I mean, everybody knows this, but basically that how dynamic the PFOS levels in fish can be. So I could foresee a time in the future. Let's say we go to a much stricter benchmark. We got to suddenly think about adjusting our advisories. It'll be important to have updated data so that you know <laughs> the advisories stay on target. Um, just you know, a reminder there. <laughs> yep, and it's it, yeah. That I think definitely that's an issue with be, being more uh, labile than like PCBs or mercury. Uh, we actually had a discussion in our lab about how to prepare smelt because. The normal size, you know, typically fish of that size would be probably done whole, but that that people eat smelt at a very small size, and so we we also decided that they'll be um, had 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 and viscera removed. So we're, we're going toward that as well. Um, backing up to the, you know, why are why are the the lake fish um, higher than the inland fish? I mean, I, at least my understanding of some, a number of the the issues in in uh, New Hampshire is that the the you know the main delivery uh, method to a lot of a lot of places is air deposition. And I think you know, I, I although I don't think it's a global cycle like mercury, I, I think. Probably what we have is some some fairly poor, poorly characterized um, air air deposition and deposition and circulation um, that's happening to to places that we wouldn't expect. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, that I think um, more reports are now coming out on on atmospheric deposition, whether it's wet deposition or dry deposition, uh, even from I think IADN, so IADN uh, network, which is US Canada um, partnership network. I think they have also collected some data and I believe uh, it, the data have been published. So anyways, this, more information is coming out. So this is going to be very important. Yeah, I think they, they recently started uh, adding uh, PFOS and I don't know whether it was wet or dry deposition to their to their uh, monitoring. And I think didn't New Jersey with their PFNA find fairly long uh, distance upwind or down, downwind transport, um, finding that in the soils? Am I misremembering that? I, I think so. And Derek just posted in the chat that um, that, that it, um, it was wet deposition, and he's actually on the the IADN.
This is Pat. I just wanted to remind people to not lump Lake Superior into that group when you're talking about big lake versus inland lake levels. Since Lake Superior is much lower and inland waters are usually higher than Lake Superior. Yes. Okay, uh, well, we've had about 20 minutes of discussion. Um, does anyone else have anything they'd like to bring up? This is Justin from Illinois EPA. Um, Summer's presentation reminded me of something that I wanted to mention. Uh, since GLRI has funded the majority of this equipment uh, that we're getting in our lab, um, part of the verbal agreement with Jackie was to um, see about making the equipment available to uh, other consortium members um, for fish tissue analysis. Um, so, you know, that said, our equipment isn't even here yet, but uh, once we get it up and running, um, Illinois is open to uh, discussions about that if it will uh, help any of the other consortium members to to analyze samples in a situation that Summer's in right now where they can't find a, uh, a contract lab or um, anything like that. Oh, that's impressive. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess hearing no other comments, we've had a good discussion. Um, I think this has been a really nice series of three meetings uh, over three mornings. And although I hope that we are able to get together next year in person, I, I think that really benefits us a lot. And I, I will go, go back to what we talked about at the end of last week and uh, consortium leadership and, and management, and please think about how you can contribute and uh, participate so that we can manage this organization for the future. And uh, I guess, does anyone else have any closing comments or final thoughts? Yeah, Wayne, that means you can't retire if you want to come to the in person meeting next year. Just a little reminder. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Tony. <laughs> I, I kind of got that impression already, but thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, then, th thank you all. Thank you all for participating. Thank you for the folks who talked. Um, I, I just really enjoyed hearing the updates. Uh, we are clearly doing a lot. Uh, thanks to the EPA folks who set, uh, sat in and listened in today and contributed to our discussion. And uh, definitely follow up with Sherry and your group about uh, future uh, session to go into more detail on the roadmap if you're interested in that. And, yeah, and, uh, and we would also love Wayne. I mean, we have, um, you know, a reporting we could share um, from the uh, 2010 and 2015 um, Great Lakes and also the rivers and the last several rivers and stream study. There's really interesting, um, you know, results because we are getting more and more PFAS. Um, and uh, John Wathen, who's on the call, is starting to look at co-occurrence. And we're seeing a lot of the same, I don't know, four or five PFAS in a lot of the fish samples, like the abundance of fish samples. So uh, at least in the rivers and streams. So I think there are lots of things um, that would be of interest to your folks. OK, good, thanks. All right. Well, I think that's it. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks very much, Wayne. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Wayne, for Bye. coordinating. Thank you. Thanks, Bye -bye. Bye. Thank you, Wayne. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Wayne. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you, everyone.